Hello, and welcome to the February and March episode of Get Outside. If you need reasons to get outside in the cold of winter, we give you some. First, we go on a tour of Massachusetts Audubon's Ipswich River Wildlife Sanctuary in Topsfield with Sanctuary Director Carol Decker. Second, I will show you some tips on finding owls in Essex County. And finally, Jim McDougall will introduce us to the art of wildlife tracking. So come along with us as we head over to Topsfield and the Ipswich River Sanctuary. Hello and welcome to Get Outside, a locally produced television show that features the abundance of natural resources and wildlife that exist right here in Essex County, a small county just north of Boston and with an easy ride from southern New Hampshire, southern Maine, and the central and western parts of the state. Our goal is really to introduce you to some of the wonderful places that we have in Essex County. Properties owned by the Essex County Greenbelt Association, Massachusetts Audubon Society, the Trustees of Reservations, as well as the Division of Forest and Parks and Mass Wildlife. We really want you to take advantage of these properties, get outside, see some wildlife, and really know what you're looking at. So we've offered some tips and some resources that we think are extremely valuable and are worth acquiring. All of the great wildlife that you're seeing and the show is shot locally right here in Essex County. Our show is only 30 minutes long, but if you want more information on natural history in the area and places to go, you can always visit our website, which is getoutsidetv.org. So what we need to do is get outside. Decker, Director of Mass Audubon's Ipswich River Wildlife Sanctuary in Topsfield. If you haven't visited the sanctuary, maybe you'll do so after seeing all there is to enjoy and explore here. Our 10 miles of trails traverse a variety of habitats, including red maple swamps, coniferous and deciduous woodlands, along with beautiful overlooks of the vast marshes of the Ipswich River. And don't let colder temperatures keep you indoors. Simply dress in layers and wear warm, comfortable footwear so you can enjoy the tranquility and special signs of nature that can only be experienced during the winter. So come along now as we explore the sanctuary. During February and March, we can still receive bone chilling temperatures, but there is clearly a change occurring. Birds like the Northern Cardinal and Tufted Titmouse can be heard singing, along with the familiar Conqueree song of the male red-winged blackbirds as they return from the south to claim nesting sites in the cattail marsh. As soon as ice leaves the waterways in late winter, keep an eye out for returning ducks like this elegantly plumaged male hooded merganser seen diving for fish in the Ipswich River. The uniquely patterned male wood duck returns from the south and can be seen feeding along the river or perched in trees. This is a colorful male with its long crest and feeding under the branches is a female identified by the prominent elliptical eye line. Wood ducks are considered cavity nesters. They nest in holes high up in trees, and acorns are a major part of their diet. Habitats which provide adequate food, water, shelter, and space are vital for all species, and the wood duck finds such areas in the protected floodplain forests and wooded swamps of the sanctuary. Discovering and learning about nature is a year-round activity at the sanctuary and we offer exciting learning experiences for families, children, and adults. Our Sugaring Off program is always popular and takes visitors into the woodlands to discover how sap is turned into maple syrup. Let's join up with a tour. Right? Yeah. If you look here, 
You've oh, got the scars. to you know, look for the scars. I, can see too. I can't see as well as you guys. The sun's in my eyes. Right, right underneath the buds is a smiling scar. That's the leaf scar from the leaf that fell off last okay. fall. Right up to the yellow line. Just And then this thing sitting on top, the shiny part, is the evaporator. It's like a big pot on the stove, except that there's no top on the stove. This pot sits right on the fire, just held up on the edges. And if you look back here, see how it sits on the fire? That's the bottom of the pan. Here, the pan goes right down into the fire. It has spins on it, so the fire can go on three sides of the... The time while the sap is running in the trees is referred to as a celebration of new life. It's also the time when we look for three resident birds at the sanctuary, they begin their courting activity even in these colder months. We look for the eastern bluebird, pileated woodpecker, and barred owl. A popular spot to find bluebirds is in the fields on Bradstreet Hill, where they can be found sunning atop nest boxes on winter days. The boxes are built and monitored by sanctuary volunteers, and these artificial nesting sites help the bluebird return from a precipitous decline. Listen carefully for the soft notes and song of the male eastern bluebird. The pileated woodpecker is a handsome bird. It is the largest woodpecker now seen in North America, and pileated refers to its crest, which is vibrant red. Its large beak helps it excavate deep into trees, where it can locate one of its favorite foods, carpenter ants. During the 19th century, this bird was uncommon due to extensive clearing of the forest. Thankfully, its numbers have increased and though not common, it can be found in both the carnivorous and mixed hardwood forests of the sanctuary. Woodpeckers do not have the ability to sing, but listens for its loud drumming used to defend its territory. Difficult to find during the day, barred owls can best be heard hooting at night, preferring wetland habitats over the forest preferences of its larger, largest cousin, the great horned owl. This beautiful sparrow was found scratching on the ground in the bird feeding area. Called the fox sparrow due to its bright rusty color, these chunky sparrows generally pass through our area in late March and early April on their flight to far northern nesting grounds. This sparrow uses both feet to locate seeds, which it can crush in its thick bill. Not generally seen at the sanctuary during winter is this yellow rumped warbler. This one has found some poison ivy berries that will provide needed fat on this cold winter day. During winter, the bird is much duller, but soon it will molt into the rich blacks and white colors of its breeding plumage. This warbler is easy to identify due to its bright yellow rump, which is visible in all seasons. Here's a group learning how to read animal tracks and sign. By interpreting animal tracks, you will know the animal, what it is feeding on, and where and when to look for it. Jim McDougall tracked this mink and found it close to one of the wetland boardwalks. Here it found a dry area under a white pine tree and decided to curl up and clean its fur. Minks are small, weighing one to two pounds, but they are energetic members of the weasel family and favor all kinds of wetland areas. They feed on fish, muskrat frogs, and even small rodents. And as you can see here, they have a dark brown coat. It's thick and dense, and also notice the white patch under the chin. These animals are primarily nocturnal, preferring to hunt at night, but you may also see them during the day. What a beautiful day to be outdoors. There's so much more to see here, but now it's time for you to venture outdoors and make your own discoveries. We hope to see you at the Ipswich River Wildlife Sanctuary this winter. Well, we hope you enjoyed that quick tour. If you'd like more information on the Ipswich River Wildlife Sanctuary, you can go to our website, which will be posted at the end of this show. And now, let's hear some tips on finding owls. Almost anyone who has ever seen an owl, as well as anyone who has not, is fascinated by these creatures and wants to learn more about them. Fortunately, owls are a lot easier to find than one might think. Certainly, the best way to find them is to be out in the middle of the night or extremely early in the morning when it's still dark and the birds are active. A calm night with as little wind as possible is best, 
so that you can hear the calls of owls and find them that way. The two most common owls in Essex County are the Great Horned Owl, which is quite numerous, and the Eastern Screech Owl, which comes in the red form, seen here, and the gray form. The best way to find owls at night is to imitate their calls or play a tape. This attracts the owls, and you might end up having a conversation, which might look something like this. Owls respond best to calls during the mating season, which takes place in late winter. They will respond to you because they're either seeking a mate or defending their territory from a perceived rival. Although owls are most easily found at night, you don't need to stop your owling activities just because the sun has come up. Quite often, an owl will perch out in the open, like this great horned owl, either to take in the sun or to survey its territory and defend it from threats to young birds on the nest. Horned owls take old crow or hawk nests, but screech owls are cavity nesters, and they can be found in their holes during the day. Also, birdhouses are suitable places for screech owls if the hole is large enough. Notice how this screech owl fluffs out its feathers to block the hole and keep any cold drafts from getting into the box. This helps it stay warm. In addition to those two most common owls found in Essex County, there are others that can easily be seen during the day. The snowy owl is a visitor from the north. It can be seen perched on the ground or on prominent perches like telephone poles. In some winters, the snowy owl can be quite common in Essex County, while in other winters, it may be entirely absent. It comes in search of food when there is a shortage in the north. Another winter visitor is the short-eared owl, and like the snowy owl, it too can be found flying about during the day, hunting over open grasslands. The short-eared is most easily found at dawn or dusk, at which time you can enjoy its graceful aerobatics. Its flight has been, quite rightly, likened to that of a moth. Notice the floppy wings. If you go to an area where owls roost and look up into the trees, what you at first thought was a branch may turn out to be a long-eared owl. Even if you've never seen an owl, just keep those eyes wide open, get outside, and if you keep at it, you will find owls. Well, we've been looking up into trees. Now let's focus our attention on the ground, where Jim McDougall will show us some animal tracking techniques. Hi, and welcome to uh, Get Outside. Uh, we're actually going to do this little section in our um attached vacation home and uh, we want to go over some of the uh, publications that you're probably going to need in order to get outside and enjoy yourself, understand what you see. We do want you to get outside, we do want you to have fun and part of the fun is certainly for me is to know what I'm seeing when I'm out there. Right now we're going to focus our show today on some of the tracks. It's uh, January, we've had some tremendous Snow falls already. Christmas day we had a nice snow. Then we've had uh, sort of a cement that came down uh, yesterday and last night it ended up with a nice light fluffy snow. So we, we're gonna go out and take advantage of that snow that ended sometime around midnight last night. 
And this morning we should have some wonderful tracks of animals that have been walking around uh, after midnight. Uh, the reason we want to get out early and the reason we want to have a snowstorm that runs into the night is that um, there's a lot of dogs around. Dogs leave a lot of tracks and it sort of contaminates our, um, uh, our experience. It, uh, we would like to eliminate things like dogs from what tracks that we can see and then we know what we are seeing are probably wild animals with the exception of house cats. There's a lot of house cats out there in the nighttime, so we'll be picking up uh, some cat tracks as well. But in order to get out there and really understand what you um, are seeing, there are a few publications that you can start to read at night while you're nice and warm and cozy in front of the fire. This, um, the best book on seeing animal tracks and understanding them is this wonderful publication by Paul Resendez, who's from the Berkshires. Uh, it's called Tracking in the Art of Seeing. It's how to read animal tracks and sign. And uh, this has been out for about 10 years. It is a remarkable book. It's based on his personal experience. He's a wonderful photographer, a wonderful artist. And he, um, he really gets involved in sort of the type of sign that you're going to see here in New England. Um, his measurements are right on the money. He has ways of sort of teasing out which track uh, is which. What's the difference between a gray fox and a red fox? What's the difference between a red fox and a coyote? These are all things that um, uh, are important because we've got them all right here. Now, uh, there's a tremendous section here on one of the common weasels that we have around here, which is the fisher. The fisher is a large weasel. It uh, runs somewhere between 8, uh, 12, maybe 14 pounds and gets up as, as big as uh, 3 feet long. Uh, and they're, and they're, they're common. They're very nocturnal, so we don't see them a lot during the daytime. We do see them occasionally. But to give you an idea of the way Paul has um, formatted this particular book, what you have here is a, a wonderful uh, depiction schematic of a lopping uh, Fisher, the four prints, four prints, four prints, four prints, and this is a, this is a common sort of gait and track pattern that you're going to see out in the snow for Fisher. But he also gets involved in these other schematics where um, depending if they're walking, if they're running really hard, how the tracks would appear. He has pictures of uh, the paws, uh, and he's taken pictures of them um, in various things, snow and on mud, uh, how the, what the paws look like. So this is one that I strongly recommend. Again, it's The Tracking and the Art of Seeing by Paul Resendis. And uh, it might be a little pricey, but um, it's definitely worth the money. It's one of the best books I think I've ever um, purchased. A more localized mammal book is Alfred Godin's Wild Mammals of New England. This is kind of neat because he's got some very nice maps associated with each species so that you can have an idea of exactly um, where they exist in New England. Uh, I believe this is one of the flying squirrels and you can see it must be southern flying squirrel because it's essentially from central Maine south as you can see on that picture. Um, so that's a nice one to see where the various animals exist. And a more generalized book uh, pu uh, published by a gentleman, or written by a, a gentleman in um, Concord, Mass. Peter Alden has put together this uh, field guide, a National Audubon field guide to New England. And it does include mammals, but it has birds, butterflies, dragonflies. Um, and uh, it was co-authored by Brian Cassie, who's from Foxborough. These are local guys, uh, extraordinary individuals who spent uh, their entire life uh, figuring out uh, some of the answers to the questions of uh, what's outside. A really neat local publication that I really think that uh, everyone should subscribe to is called Massachusetts Wildlife. It's put out by the Mass Wildlife, the local state agency that takes care of all of our native animals. And this particular issue, which is uh, the second issue of 2001, uh, is on bones of wildlife of North America. 
and it is written and all put together by a gentleman who works at the uh, Ipswich River Wildlife Sanctuary in Topsfield here for Mass Audubon Society. His name is Richard Wolnowitz. And this is an absolutely remarkable uh, article. He has uh, acquired all the bones of all the mammals of North America. He has laid them out in a format that compares each one so that you understand the difference between a, uh, a mole from a mouse, from a shrew, from a vole, as well as rabbits, squirrels, uh, weasels, the whole bit. And this is extremely important uh, when you start studying owl pellets. You're going to come across a lot of uh, skulls in owl pellets. You might come across a single skull somewhere in the woods, like these rabbit skulls that he's um, put together for you with the uh, identifying features. He's got little arrows showing you really what to look for to identify the various bones of wildlife. So I would strongly recommend getting Massachusetts Wildlife. It comes out four times a year and um, you can acquire it by calling a toll-free number at 1-800-289-4778 or go on their website at www.masswildlife.org Org, o -R -G. So um, these are the sorts of publications you can work on while you're sitting at home in front of the fire, having a nice cup of something, and um, learning about what's outside. So let's get outside. Now these are what we're hoping won't contaminate our tracking expedition in the morning. We've got a bunch of tracks. This animal is moving that way and it's um, a big animal. Here's my hand. These things are two and a half to three inches across. They're very round and you can see how they alternate back and forth. I would expect this is a dog track. It's old. It's been snowed on but it is a dog track. It's not quite far enough apart for deer. And uh, the one, one element to keep in ma mind, you're gonna be dealing with a number of sort of dog species. We've got a lot of domestic dogs around. We've got quite a few coyotes. We have a few red fox in various areas of the county. And now we're getting a gray fox. So you've got all those to contend with. This is big and round. Big and round means domestic dog. Well, here we've got another great track that's um, come across our path. And we've got a lot better light here for you to be able to see it. This is very... I'm going to get out in front here so you can see it and get a sense of scale. There's my hand. But if you notice it, it's, it's relatively uniform, straight line. A track, a track, a track, a track, a track. These are actually two tracks, one on top of the other. And if I look closely, you won't see it. This this so snow is just a little too fluffy to get all the detail that you want. But it's obvious here that there is no uh, paw uh, claw prints in it. So it's an animal that retracts its claws. And there's um, actually there are a couple that do that. Um, house cat is the most common. And gray fox also has a... Um, uh, somewhat retra retractable claw. So this, without a doubt, is a house cat that's coming over from the neighbor's yard and heading towards um, our uh, bird feeding station. So what you've got here is a tail drag. We've got a front foot and a back foot and a back foot. I'm not too sure what those are, but if you were to, if we had better snow, what you'd be seeing is five claws, five toe pads involved in this. Uh, we won't be able to see that because it's so fluffy. But um, this is where our fisher's going. And if you want a key feature here, as uh, most fishers do, um, underneath the snow right here, there's a stone wall. 
And boy, they love following stone walls because associated with stone walls are things like white-footed mice that they love to eat. Now we're going to move from uh, our fisher tracks to the edge of a wetland where we've got two other mammals that live near water or in water most of the time. On the right we've got some beaver tracks coming out of this little uh, open water. And they're a large sloppy track. Uh, they have to drag that big tail with them. And if you look more closely what you're going to see are some uh, small front feet leaving a track and then the large hind feet will be stepping on that uh, previous track laid down. So uh, we're going to move over to the left where we've had two otters come out of the open water and they're sliding on their bellies pushing along with their hind feet. They do the same thing on upland. This is a typical slide of the otter. Now we've gone over all sorts of tracks and given you a quick review of how you can uh, approach this particular topic. But it really comes down to you got to get out and start watching these animals, see how they move, how they walk, uh, what excites them, what um, uh, makes them come out and walk where they do. This is a gray fox. You can nicely watch its gait right here where it's placing its front paws in relation to its back paws. Uh, here's a coyote that is... Um, studying an open area, doesn't want to cross the open area, they don't feel all that comfortable out in the open, particularly during the daytime, so it's sort of checking everything out. So you'll see that all four feet are firmly planted. It will leave a nice little track right there if this were on mud or snow. And during the um, winter months, you'd be able to tell the behavior of this particular animal, which would actually show that um, two other coyotes just had walked by prior to this filming and this one is uh, particularly nervous that they're in its territory and um, it's quite a bit smaller than the other two that went by and is um, not quite sure uh, what it's going to do about the whole thing so it's going to sort of check out their scent and move back. Now I've slowed down this particular tape of a fisher cat to five percent of its normal speed. Much how the hind left foot steps where the front right foot was and that's the reason why we're seeing uh, sort of uh, three tracks associated with a loping uh, fissure. Uh, so once you get to see these animals, um, you'll understand their tracks better and you'll enjoy yourself when you get outside. Well, thanks for joining us for another episode of Get Outside. We hope that by watching us on TV, you've been inspired to turn off your TV and do as the title of our show suggests. If you'd like more information, visit our website, getoutsidetv.org. Thanks for watching. Every once in a while you just get lucky uh, to be in the right place at the right time. Um, I was trying to call in some small birds by using a squeaking noise and um, instead what I called in was uh, this mink which was next to one of the boardwalks at the uh, Ipswich River Wildlife Sanctuary in Topsfield and uh, as I was uh, filming uh, it uh, what I realized it was doing was building a little nest for the evening where it was going to take a nap and it uh, acted a lot like um, a dog making a bed sort of going around in circles um, patting it down checking things out and uh, waiting for the perfect moment for when it would be um, just right and comfortable and uh, where it could uh, just uh, fall asleep <laughs>